Hey, it's Rasikas here, and ever since the first Nintendo Direct about Splatoon 2's game mode, Salmon Run, I've been very interested in the company running the operation, Grisco Industries. The company is sketchy, utilizes illegally modified weaponry, and is run by a mysterious shady figure with unknown motives. The identity of this shady figure, Mr. Grizz, has been a major point of speculation among Splatoon fans. Who is he? A sea bear? A giant fish in a bear suit? My desire to learn more about Grizzco and Mr. Grizz is the very reason why I started translating the Splatoon art books and interviews in the first place. But it's been four years since we first learned about Grizzco, and we still don't really have answers about who is running the company and why he needs so many golden eggs. With the story of Splatoon 3 involving Salmon, I have a very strong feeling that we're going to finally get some answers to these questions. But for the time being, all we can really do is speculate. So that's what I'm here to do today. I'm going to present to you pretty much everything that we know about Grizzco, go over some popular theories I've seen floating around about the identity of Mr. Grizz, many I've heard from you, my dear viewers, and give my own thoughts. So let's get started. So first of all, what do we know about Grizzco Industries? Starting off with first impressions, as Splatoon art director Seita Inoue puts it, the Grizzco building has the image of being like a Japanese restaurant outside of Japan that isn't run by Japanese people. By design, Grizzco is supposed to feel a little exotic and that there's something not quite right about it. In the second art book, Grizzco is described as a fishery and trading company that mainly deals in the exchange of the valuable resource, salmon eggs. The Angopolis Square office only opens during peak salmon run season, and when it's open, the company offers egg collection work to part-timers. During these shifts, employees board chartered fishing boats into a restricted zone, as it's called, which is an area subject to strange magnetic fields that prevent inklings from super jumping normally. But the most important thing about this area is that it's home to salmonids. I won't be going too in-depth about salmonids themselves in this video because I already made a video explaining pretty much all we know about salmonids so far in regards to their culture and society. But basically, the salmonids are a kind of sentient fish creature that are also considered dangerous to the inklings. Salmonids arm themselves with cooking utensils and are willing to fight to the death. When defeated, these salmonids drop their eggs. There are two kinds of salmon eggs that we know of, the more common power eggs, and the mysterious and even more valuable golden eggs which only drop from boss salmonid. It's been outright stated by the developers that Grizzco's goal is not to exterminate the salmonid, it's just to steal these eggs. The fact that these eggs have to be stolen is an important one. The very reason why Grisco has to do what it does is because, unlike the Octarians who do have a trade agreement where the Salmonid exchange their eggs for Octarian technology, the Inklings do not have such a trade agreement with the Salmonid. The relationship between Inklings and Salmonid is unstable, and there seems to be some historical conflict that goes far back. It's said that in pre-medieval times, before effective defense measures such as long-range ink attacks were available, many cities fell before the rage of the Salmonid rush. So what are these eggs for? Well, in the Splatoon world, fish eggs are one of the world's energy sources, making them quite valuable. Considering that Grisco has enough money to put out commercials on the Inkopolis news very frequently, I think it's safe to assume that Grisco is profiting off power eggs to fund their operation. According to the Salmonid Field Guide, unauthorized contact between Inklings and Salmonid is illegal. Judging by the importance of power eggs as an energy source, and the fact they are able to put commercials on the news, I think points towards Grisco having special permission to enter Salmonid territory rather than them doing so illegally. Another thing about Grisco is that whether or not it's a well-known company is a mystery, and according to Hisashi Nogami, Splatoon's director, nobody even knows if it's a company. I'm still going to refer to it as a company, but keep that in mind. Apparently, Grusco is listed on a registry, but the address listed is actually a vacant lot, so no one can investigate into this organization. The company doesn't seem to have any connections to anyone in Ingopolis Square, and not even Spike knows anything. So no, I don't think Spike is Mr. Grizz. Something else that could be true about Grizzco is that maybe it's been around for a while. 
In a 2017 Nintendo Direct, we got the very first message from Grisco Industries, and it feels very... 80s, with the music and the video quality, as if it's an instructional video that they're reusing for a newer generation of egg collectors. I don't know how much to trust a promotional video from a Nintendo Direct as canon, but with power eggs being indispensable in supporting the modern lifestyles enjoyed by the residents of Inkopolis, Grisco having been around for a good while seems believable to me. So I've been talking a bit about the company, but I haven't really said much about Mr. Grizz yet. What do we actually know about him? Well, nobody knows what Mr. Grizz looks like. After all, the only employees that you see in the Grizzco building are part-timers who go directly onto the Grizzco boats and do their shifts. And the company isn't literally operated by the statue, that's just a radio carved from wood in the shape of the salmon's mythical ancient enemy, the bear. The design of this radio is based off the Kibori Kuma, a traditional craft produced mainly in the Hokkaido region of Japan. There's a speaker installed inside the radio, which it passes along orders from the headquarters to the Inklings. However, there isn't a microphone, so it cannot answer any questions that it might get. Another possible reason why these questions don't get answered is because whoever is at the headquarters might not even be watching the Salmon Run shifts. According to a developer interview, Mr. Grizz's messages are a programmed automated voice. Now this whole headquarters thing and the fact that an Inkopolis Square office has been specified really catches my interest. Could this mean there are more Grisco offices around the Splatoon world? I mean, surely Inkopolis isn't the only place on Earth where the culturally important sport of turf wars is held and regulated, and there being salmonid colonies beyond the waters of Inkopolis is also something that seems likely to me. But going back to the mysteriousness of Mr. Grizz, we can't even be sure Mr. Grizz is a real person, fish, or whatever. There might not be anyone actually named Mr. Grizz, and he could just be a company mascot and nothing more. Honestly, this is a theory I really, really like, so just to clarify, whenever I mention a Mr. Grizz in this video, I'm going to be vaguely talking about whoever is behind the company and not necessarily someone named Mr. Grizz. And in that same vein, we can't even be sure if Grizzco is operated by just one person behind the scenes. I mean, it's supposedly a company, so Grizzco may be operated by several people. There's actually a piece of concept art for the egg basket that explicitly mentions a company CEO, but since this is just concept art, take it with a grain of salt. But someone had to have written the manual with all this research on the salmonid, and Mr. Grizz's advice is given separately. I think this supports the idea that either Mr. Grizz is just a mascot, or there are several people behind the company. I have one more thing to support both of these ideas, but it could be a bit of a stretch. Think about what happens when you collect your rewards from Grizzco. You hear what sounds like an evil laugh, but to me it sounds different than Mr. Grizz. <laughs> like, who is that? Maybe it's just another automated recording, but still, it doesn't feel right to me. So aside from having more employees, Grizzco could also be making arrangements with other organizations. This isn't too much of a theory because this is somewhat confirmed. For one thing, the boats are chartered, so it's rented from somewhere, and who's piloting these boats? Additionally, someone wrote the Grisco music, and it's not that Mr. Grizz has his own secret musical talent. In a Famitsu interview, it was confirmed that Grisco outsourced the songwriting to someone else. And there are some more pieces of Grisco's operation that seem to necessitate some outside help. If Grisco is trading power eggs, then wouldn't they need a means to distribute the eggs? and someone had to build and install all of the machinery on the stages. The concept of just one person doing all of this without any sort of help would be very impressive. This talk of outside help leads me to want to talk about the Grisco gear. So you know how all the Grisco gear is work uniforms? The description in Haikata Walker for these pieces of gear say they've somehow leaked out of the company. One theory I like is that these businesses are all places that Grisco has trade agreements with under the table. As power eggs are a necessity for day-to-day -day life, it would make sense that these companies would need power eggs for their equipment, and Grisco is a locally sourced provider. 
and in exchange, Grizzco may not only receive cash, but also whatever overflow of gear that they have so they can distribute it to these young and hip cephalopods who seem to care a lot about fashion in order to further incentivize them to continue working at Grizzco. And maybe as part of this agreement, employees from these companies could also provide their services to Grizzco in some way. For example, the juice parka is tied to an oil company, and we see fuel canisters bearing their logo near the egg basket in Lost Outpost. Maybe this company helps refine power eggs, or Grisco needs their fuel for their boats or something. The squitter polo is tied to I Ship It, which deals in delivery. Maybe they help Grisco with some egg distribution. The headlamp helmet has a logo from Sturgeon Shipyard, which houses an under-construction tanker that will transport fish eggs. I wouldn't be surprised if the shipyard has built more egg transporting tankers, which Grisco could very well use to send their harvested power eggs around the world. I'm not going to cover my theories for every single piece of Grisco gear because there's a lot and I'm not even sure how relevant some of these are. Maybe I'm just thinking way too deeply into this as I always do and Grisco doesn't have these trade agreements for the gear and simply purchased a bunch of factory rejects or stole it or something. In the final Splatfest dialogue from the Squid Research Lab, Mr. Grizz says, Don't be so worried. The sea answers all questions. And the commentary says that, as far as this mysterious being is concerned, the shallow affairs of Angopolis are insignificant next to the vast depth of the Seven Seas. No matter what fate may await the world, the sea watches silently, biding its time. What is the sea biding its time for? And him referring to the affairs of Inkopolis as shallow feels really not trustworthy. I've always gotten the sense that Grizzco, or Mr. Grizz, is worthy of being the big bad final boss for Splatoon 3. I mean, come on, we have this evil laugh the very second we enter the Grizzco building, we're not supposed to trust that, right? <laughs> and of course we do have that New Year's 2020 message that says, save our salmon. Save them from what exactly? My guess is that it will be related to Grizzco somehow, but when it comes to the specifics, we could sit here and pointlessly guess all day. All we really know for sure about Grisco's motivations, as I mentioned before, is not to eradicate Salmonid, but rather to take eggs. And those golden eggs that we're told to collect en masse with no explanation why or exactly what they're being used for is mighty suspicious. In the past, I've talked a little bit about golden eggs, and what I can say is that I think that golden eggs at least are a much stronger source of energy than regular power eggs. They could have other uses beyond that that we don't know of yet. Again, who knows. I think this would be a good time to talk about the Grizzco weapons. We know they're the personal belongings of Mr. Grizz, and that they're super powerful, illegally modified versions of existing Inkling weaponry. They are designed to improve egg collection, rather than for regular turf wars. In a developer interview, they mentioned that if you connected a normal turf war ink tank to a Grizzco weapon, it might explode. I think salmon eggs are the very reason why these weapons are so strong. In hero mode, you're able to upgrade your weaponry using power eggs, and what you end up with is much stronger than anything you'd actually get for turf war. Maybe these Grisco weapons are showing us what would happen if one were to upgrade a weapon with golden eggs instead of power eggs. Pretty much all these weapons have these little yellow pill bottles. Maybe these contain something that was extracted from golden eggs. That's just a theory though. I didn't know where else to talk about this, but I wanted to briefly mention some unused concepts surrounding Mr. Grizz and Grizzco. There's this concept of Mr. Grizz with a hunting theme, for example, holding a rifle and saying, Fear the coming of the salmon. It's described as a setting that would even scare a bear. And there's another concept for the Salmon Run building that went even harder on the bear and salmon motifs, even utilizing honeycombs. And it seems one long-standing idea for Salmon Run was for it to have more of a firefighter motif. And there's a few pieces of early concept art that show this, including this one, showing Inklings and Octolings working together to fight what looks like a cross between a Salmon and a T-Rex. One concept that sticks out to me is where it looks like Mr. Grizz is speaking a whole nother language, and you can tell that's the intent here because the inkling speech bubble is vertical, like Japanese, while Grizz's is horizontal and the squiggles don't look like any inkling text that we've seen before. Maybe this ties into the whole exoticness of Grizz code that I mentioned earlier in this video. Before I go into speculation on who Mr. Grizz is, I have another interesting thing to note about him. 
His personality is pretty different between the English and Japanese versions of the game. The Mr. Grizz that we know, if you've been playing the English localization like I have, he is very outwardly intimidating and rude. But in Japanese, he seems to act a lot nicer to his employees. I went through the majority of Grizz's Japanese dialogue and translated it into English in a more direct way. Here's a few lines that show these differences. If you want to read all that I have translated, I'll leave a link to the document in the description. And before you complain about how all localization is shit or something, I do have my gripes with a few of the localization choices in Splatoon, and I do like this Japanese Mr. Grizz, but I think I get the reasoning for this change. From what I understand, Grizzco is supposed to be satirizing a black company, which is a Japanese term for an exploitive, sweatshop-like business, except it applies to businesses outside of manufacturing, such as IT, restaurants, office work, collecting salmon eggs, things like that. It's characterized by extreme overtime, poor pay, hostility towards unions, poor work-life balance, basically everything that could make a job terrible. Of course, there's businesses like this outside of Japan, but compared to the West, I think Japan has certain stronger stereotype about what a black company acts like that could just come across as typical corporate speak to an American like myself. One of these stereotypes is the use of flowery language, which we do even see in the English version of the Grisco manual. So because of these stereotypes, it's clear to Japanese players through the dialogue, Mr. Grizz is a little sketchy, but he seems to care about his workers. When his dialogue is directly translated into English, to some he may come across as a genuinely nice boss without these sketchy undertones. So I think they changed Mr. Grizz's dialogue to make it clearer to the Western kids playing the game that Grisco is not a super trustworthy company. So now that I've covered all this info and some of my theories about Grisco, now I want to actually delve into the core question of this video. Who is Mr. Grizz? There's a lot of theories out there, and I'm going to cover every theory that I think is worthwhile to mention, and give my own thoughts. So to start things off... Mr. Grizz being Commander Tartar. I felt I should talk about this first because this is the one I see thrown around a lot, and some people have brought up potential proof that Grizzko and Kamaboko are related. Like, what about the signage that appears in both Kamaboko and in front of Grisco? This is just inkling text that's supposed to resemble the kanji for no trespassing, so I don't think this connection has any importance. So I think the biggest fuel in the fire of this theory is the shared, bigger-than-yourself piece of dialogue. It's a line of dialogue that's said by Mr. Grizz when you first enter Grisco, and you get the same piece of dialogue from Tartar before you enter the Promised Land. I even pointed out this parallel in my iceberg video and mentioned that it seemed suspicious. So suspicious that I dug a little deeper into it out of curiosity. And guess what, guys? Guess what? These parallels between Grizz and Tartar do not exist in the original Japanese version of the game. It is solely a product of localization. So we can throw that piece of evidence out the window. But that's not the only reason why I don't think Tartar is Mr. Grizz. This is because the events of story mode directly affect what happens in Inkopolis. The end of Octo Valley and Octo Canyon game modes have the direct effect of Octavio being put in a snow globe and the Zapfish being put back where it belongs. The events of Octo Expansion led to the Nils statue being collapsed out in the ocean and Agent 8 and many other Octolings who are not Agent 8 coming to the surface en masse. And even if it seems unclear where this all stands on a timeline exactly, because it's basically dependent on when a player finishes these story modes, time passes and these events do happen. The world of Splatoon is all connected. In the sense of a literal timeline of events, Agent 8 escaped the Deep Sea Metro, inked a giant statue that was going to destroy Ingopolis, and Tartar died. Like, I can't rule out the possibility of Tartar being repaired in the future or something because he's a machine, but during the events of Splatoon 2, which is the same time Grisco is in operation, Tartar died. So why am I emphasizing this? Well, by this logic, if Tartar was Mr. Grizz, then surely something would have happened to Grisco following Tartar's death, right? 
Yeah, nothing happened. Sea Cucumber even says that Kamaboko is left in disarray when you return after Tartar's death. If you're wondering how the Deep Sea Metro is still running after Tartar dies, well one, it would be crappy to pay $20 for a DLC that you can only play once, and two, in a dev interview it was mentioned that the Deep Sea Metro is a university town built by Kamaboko, and the denizens of the Deep who take the Deep Sea Metro simply live there without taking these tests and are just going to work or school. It sounds reasonable that Sea Cucumber and other Deep Sea denizens would continue to maintain this infrastructure in a more benign manner without Tartar's murderous intents. But anyways, I don't think I can completely rule out the possibility of Grisco having ties to the Deep Sea or Kamaboko. I mean, both Kamaboko and Grisco are these sketchy, mysterious organizations, and remember that Grisco video from the Nintendo Direct? It has a dated, nostalgic feeling like the entire theme of the Deep Sea Metro. And I'm thinking about another thing I translated, which is like a recruitment advertisement for Kamaboko test subjects. The eerily cheery wording of it reminds me of the Grisco employee manual. I think this is maybe more of a parallel to how Grisco and Kamaboko are not supposed to be trusted, rather than actually showing the companies are run by the same entity. I have one more important reason why I don't think that Mr. Grizz is Tartar, and I'm going to mention that in a little bit here. But first, I need to talk about the next theory that I've heard, which is... Mr. Grizz being DJ Octavio. So this idea for this theory is based around the fact that the Salmonid will not trade their golden eggs to the Octarians because they're precious to the Salmonid. So what if Octavio started Grisco because he wanted golden eggs, as they're a stronger source of energy? Now knowing Octarian society is collapsing and that the Octarians are in desperate need of energy, I can understand the basic reasoning behind this theory. But I think this theory collapses beyond that. Once again, like with what I mentioned with Tartar, the events of story mode affect what happens in Agopolis. During the offense of Splatoon 2, Octavio kidnaps Callie to increase his approval ratings, or rather she ran off and sympathized with the Octarians as the Inkling should. He then stole the Great Zapfish once again to try and save his people's crumbling society, and then was defeated by Agent 4 and trapped in a snow globe. Meanwhile, Grisco has been operating the entire time seemingly unaffected by these events. If Grisco was Octavio's backup plan following his failure of stealing the Great Zapfish in Splatoon 1, I don't see why Octavio would need to go and steal the Zapfish again, because clearly Grisco is getting a lot of golden eggs and a lot of power and money. And how would Octavio be managing Grisco from inside a snow globe? That makes no sense. And I don't want Octavio to be the final boss for the third time. And let's go back to the trade agreement that the Salmonids and Octarians have already. It just seems like a highly risky and very poor business decision to suddenly go back on this valuable trade agreement and just start killing the species that they have this agreement with. Like, if the Salmonid find out that the Octarian army is behind Grisco, they're going to end the trade agreement and the Octarians are going to be completely screwed in terms of power. So remember how I said I had an important reason I'd talk about later as to why I don't think Grizz is Tartar? Well now I'm going to talk about it because it also applies to DJ Octavio. Chaos versus Order The side that each character is on represents their motivations and ideals, and maybe how they'll tie into the story of Splatoon 3. Octavio is aligned with Chaos. Tartar is aligned with Order. Mr. Grizz isn't even connected with any of that and is on Team Neutral. I have no reason to believe that any of the individual characters who have had their motivations outlined, even vaguely, in terms of chaos and order, are going to be Mr. Grizz. I firmly believe that Mr. Grizz is going to be something or someone we haven't met yet, or if it's an existing character, then one that wasn't part of Chaos vs. Order. So now I'm going to talk about an existing character that I've seen a lot of people theorizing to be the mind behind Grizzco Industries. And that is... The Professor. Okay, one reason why I don't want this is because if the Nell statue is anything to go by, I don't think I want to see a living human in the Splatoon art style. But also because we just got the It Was Humans plot twist in Octo Expansion, and if they pull it on us again, I think maybe it wouldn't be all that surprising in comparison to the first time. Then again, they did use Octavio twice in a row. Aside from all that, a better reason why I do not find this theory likely is because what little that we know about the Professor is that he seems like a pretty good guy. We know that the Professor cryogenically froze Judd to survive the mass extinction event. 
We also know that the professor built Tartar to pass down mankind's knowledge so the next intelligent life would not make the same mistakes. Judd was cryogenically frozen because the professor knew he was not going to be around. Tartar was built because the professor knew he was not going to be around. And before you talk about how the professor has the immortality serum that he injected Judd with, maybe he can inject himself with it. Well, I don't know, like, immortality seems like its own kind of hell, and I would see why he or anyone else would not do that. Maybe Judd consented to that, I don't know. Or maybe he did, and then he tried to freeze himself, and then he died. But really, I mean, look at what happened to Tartar, a uh, machine. The whole reason why Tartar's programming went all genocidal is because it was lonely. Because the professor was not around. And the very last thing that Tartar says before dying is like, Our reunion beckons, professor. If the professor is somehow still alive, that line just does not have any weight to it. Tartar is dead, the professor is dead. So if the professor was still alive, why would he not be with Judd, the cat that he clearly loved? Why would he not be passing down the knowledge of mankind himself? Or why would he not have checked on Tartar at all to make sure it was doing what he intended it to do? The idea that the professor is still alive and running Grisco and doing this shady operation leads to these major plot holes about what we know about the professor's character that could only be explained away through stupid cop-out reasons. So yeah, this is why I don't think the professor is Mr. Grizz. This is not me trying to rule out the possibility of Mr. Grizz being associated with the professor in some way. I just don't think Grizz is literally going to be the professor. So why other existing characters are not on this Chaos vs. Order alignment? Pearl's dad, um, this dude is super rich and we've never seen him before. I don't have a lot of faith in this one, I'm just throwing it out there. Uh, Bamboo Hat from the Splatoon manga. I don't really know much about the manga, but there's this one page where she can be seen carving an iconic wooden bear with a fish in its mouth. I've had multiple people ask me like, oh, what does this mean? Well the manga is not canon. It doesn't really mean anything to the story's platoon. Maybe she's just carving a replica. Moving on from that. Okay, uh, what about a Moses Schellendorf, also known as Sheldon's grandpa, who designs all the weapons? What if he's the mind behind Grisco? This is kind of a joke theory, but the more I thought about it, the more merit it seems to have. I honestly haven't really seen anyone else suggest this theory aside from myself, probably because people forget he exists or because, you know, maybe he's dead. But I don't think there's anything that outright states that he died. I mean, even in this 2015 dev interview with Famitsu Magazine, Captain Cuttlefish was said to be the last inkling survivor of the Squid Beak Splatoon. Keyword, inkling. Schellendorf is not an inkling. If you want to ask how he could still be alive after all these years, I mean with Captain Cuttlefish we have the reasoning that he sun dries because that's what Inklings do past the age of 50. So perhaps a Moses' longevity can be attributed to how horseshoe crabs are considered living fossils. This concept of species that are living fossils actually having longer lifespans was touched upon when the developers were trying to find a species that would be the weapon seller in Splatoon 1's concept art. Beyond him possibly not being dead, what about Amosis' motivations? We don't know a lot about Amosis as a character. Maybe he still kept his anti-Octarian sentiments after the war and decided to take out the Octarians' energy from the source by stealing from their ally, the Salmonid. No idea. And of course, the biggest lead on this theory would be the illegally modified Grisco weapons. The Ammonite's Weapons Enhancifier uses equipment that was created while researching the technologies used to convert the energy of power eggs into something usable. Maybe Amosis is experimenting with ways to enhance weapons using technologies that convert the energy of golden eggs. Remember my theory from earlier about the yellow pill bottles on the Grisco weapons containing something that was extracted from golden eggs? So yeah, that. Once again, I don't have a lot of faith in this theory because it's kind of a joke, but just in case, I gotta say it. Mr. Grizz being a literal mammalian bear. If you've known me, or have seen some of my other videos, you should know I have a very strong distaste for this theory. There's some interesting evidence, which I'll get to in a bit, but I have my reasons why I don't want this. And my number one reason is because it really feels like Mr. Grizz's identity is this huge secret, and I don't want the answer to be something that seems super obvious. 
If you give someone the most rudimentary knowledge of Splatoon, like this is a shooter game for kids and there's these talking sea creatures and a cat or whatever, and throw them into Grizzco and ask them, who do they think Mr. Grizz is? I bet money that most would say that he's a bear. Like, this is just one of the most basic common theories. I mean, his name is Mr. Grizz, like, <laughs> Grizzly Bear. His name in Japanese and several other languages is literally Mr. Bear. He speaks out of a radio shaped like a bear. Like, of course, you would be led to believe that this is a bear. Duh. If this is the actual answer, I would just be disappointed. What about all the other possible evidence pointing towards the bear theory, like all the stuff in Arc Polaris? Alright, let's talk about that. The ruins of Arc Polaris seem to be painting a story here. What we have is possibly a human mage spaceship named after Polaris, the star in the constellation Ursa Minor, you know, little bear, and it has Ark in the name, like Noah's Ark, which implies that there must have been animals taken aboard this ship. Then we have signs that read active bear area in English, once again may be human made, because as far as we know these sea creatures do not speak English. And indeed there was a bear active in this area because we can see some bear footprints. And on top of that there is salmon and graffiti depicting a bear eating a salmon. Like, there's no denying a bear has been here, but the real question is, how is this all tied into Splatoon's story? While well, we can speculate all day, but the Mr. Grizz theory I often see drawn from this is some variation of Grizz having ties to this Arc Polaris project, him being this bear that made the footprint, and is the one all these signs are warning about. If Mr. Grizz is this bear and is still alive, there are some major hurdles that would require an explanation, like how he was able to survive for 12,000 years, and how he is sentient and able to speak the Inkling language. Judd's immortality and survival feels like an extraordinary circumstance, both coming from his ties to the Professor. And honestly, I feel like something like this would also be explained away with the Professor if Mr. Grizz does turn out to be a literal bear. But regardless of all this, I still do not want a bear to be the mastermind of Grizzco. Once again, it's just too straightforward. Mr. Grizz is this secretive character that is treated as this huge mystery by the fanbase and the developers. So would he really have his entire origin story seemingly laid out so obviously in front of us? Well, this is a Nintendo game for kids, so possibly. But then I think about Octo Expansion and how literally everyone I know, including myself, was genuinely surprised by Kamaboko's ties to humans. So my proposal is that the Mr. Grizz is a bear stuff is a red herring, and maybe all this Arc Polaris stuff ties into the story of Grizzco in a way that we are not expecting. Like yeah, there's definitely a bear here, but it maybe it died like the rest of the mammals. There's a footprint here, yes, but it survives the rapidly changing tides instead of washing away like a fresh print is supposed to, so maybe it's fossilized. And perhaps the graffiti is just representing the Salmonids myths. The second art book describes bears as mythical and having once existed. If that line is a red herring, I would think it's a really crappy red herring because one, it's in the art book which is a supplementary material that costs money and many Splatoon fans unfortunately do not have access to, and two, the fact that there's no mammals except for Judd is like the one fact of Splatoon that I constantly see people questioning, ignoring, or finding workarounds for anyways. So basically this info is not widely deterring people from believing Mr. Grizz is a mammalian bear, which is why I'm inclined to take it at face value. So I am betting and hoping that the bear iconography in Grizzco is nothing more than that. Iconography. A mascot. Just symbolic of how bears used to hunt salmon. And maybe even symbolic of something that happened at the ruins of Arc Polaris. Despite all my reasoning and me not wanting it, I still feel like the bear thing is unfortunately a very real possibility. I mean, have you thought about why we have the beekeeper hat? Do you know what animal really likes eating honey and bees? There's a lot of Mr. Grizz theories that don't necessarily contradict any canon information that we have, but also don't have a lot specifically in favor for it either. These kinds of theories, if they end up being the official answer, I would be fine with it. A very popular one of these kinds of theories is Mr. Grizz being an AI. I think some people who voted for this on my poll did so with the idea in mind that 
Grizz is Tartar, which I just ripped to shreds, but the idea that Grizz is a different AI could be an alternate and more favorable explanation for these connections between Grizz and Tartar. One thing I see people cite for this theory is the whole automated voice thing mentioned in that one developer interview. I don't think an AI is the only explanation for that, but it is a possibility. Then again, we did just get a villain that was an old AI, so I don't know if I want that twice in a row, but other than that, I don't really have a lot specifically for or against this theory, so it goes in the, yeah, maybe, bin. Mr. Grizz being a water bear. Whenever I say I don't want Mr. Grizz to be a bear, all the smartest people on Earth collectively go like, what if he's a water bear? You know what that is, right? I know what a water bear is, I know it's called a tardigrade, I've seen this theory tossed around in my mentions since 2018, please stop commenting it like I've never heard it before. Please. Anyways, this also goes in the, yeah, maybe, bin. For one thing, they're also called bears in Japanese, rather bear bugs, so the pun still checks out. Tardigrades can also survive in extremely harsh conditions, ranging from mountaintops to the deep sea, and they have been famously sent to outer space to test their hardiness. So that all makes it very likely that they survived the Great Flooding 12,000 years ago, and there's the potential for Splatoon 3 having more of a space theme, so that could all be fitting. And if a tardigrade is running Grizzco, his small size could be how Grizz is able to keep his identity a secret so well. Again, I don't have a lot specifically for or against this, so I'll just leave it at that. Mr. Grizz being an Octarian that isn't Octavio. So if Mr. Grizz was an Octarian, then that could explain why Grizzco has so much knowledge about Salmonid in the first place. We know the Salmonids and Octarians have a trade agreement, so maybe they've traded some cultural and military knowledge too. We also know Grizzco does have special technology and modified ink-based weaponry, kind of like the Octarians. But like I outlined in my critique of Octavio running Grizzco, it seems very likely that the Salmonid would simply cut off their trade agreement with the Octarians, screwing them out of their last major power source. So I think that if this were the case, this Octarian would have to have defected from the military. So yeah, an Octarian not associated with Octavia's army, I would be fine with that, so as long as there's a good reason for it. Mr. Grizz being a Salmonid. This has a very similar basis and reasoning with the Octarian theory I just mentioned, where it would explain how Grizzco has all of this knowledge about the military of the species that is supposedly illegal for Inklings to interact with. Though I don't know why a Salmonid would be actively working against their own kind and working with Inkling, so this theory is a little weird. Okay, the very last theory I'm going to talk about in this video is my personal favorite. Call me boring, but I really hope Mr. Grizz is just an Inkling. Or a jellyfish, or some sort of Inkling-associated species, but preferably an Inkling. After all, Grizzco operates from within Inkling society, and is supposedly working in a way that benefits Inklings. And I think Mr. Grizz being an Inkling and taking on an antagonistic role would be great. Here's why. So the past antagonists of Splatoon have been an external force threatening the Inkling's way of life. In these storylines, on the surface level, Inklings are presented as the heroes, yet when you dive deeper, the nature of the Inklings' very own society is the reason for these antagonists to exist in the first place. Octavio's theft of the Great Zapfish is presented as evil, but his motivations was to help ensure the survival of their crumbling society, the collapse of which is the result of the Inklings winning the Great Turf War 100 years prior, forcing them underground, and leaving the general Inkling populace completely unaware of the Octarians' existence. Commander Tartar, who is admittedly much less justified for wanting to commit genocide, does cite the whole Inkling Octarian race war and Inkling consumers' culture as reasons for its actions. So I think having Mr. Grizz serve a villainous role, framing Grizzco stealing from the Salmonids as a bad thing, could be an excellent chance to highlight the issues of the Inklings' own society, like their greed and disregard for the livelihood of these other species. In my opinion, Grizz being an Inkling would really hammer in that this is someone who is part of Inkling society, more so than a bear or an ancient machine or the Octarians again. Of course, this would have to be presented in a way that doesn't make the Inklings look evil, because a the theme of Splatoon is that nobody is actually evil, they just have their own society and they're all fighting for resources. 
Ultimately, those are just my hopes. We don't even know to what extent Mr. Grease is allied with Inkling society, if at all. As much as I like the idea of Mr. Grease being an Inkling, as it could serve as a strong critique of the Inkling way of life, I think that the whole exotic feeling Grisco is designed to have could actually be pointing towards that he could very well be yet another external force like Tartar and Octavia, with the difference being that Inklings are his unwitting pawns this time around. I don't know what the developers are planning, it might just be something totally insane, unlike my more grounded ideas. All we can do is guess, wait, and see. So this video was just an incredibly long way of me saying that I apparently don't like a lot of the Mr. Grizz theories I've heard out there, and that I hope Mr. Grizz is a villain. I'm not expecting everything in this video to age super well, but I'll be happy if one or a few of my theories have some merit in the end. Especially if we don't get Mr. Grizz as a bear, please. Anyways, thank you for watching, and thank you for 15,000 subscribers, that's a lot of people. And of course, thank you to my patrons for your direct support. This was honestly the most difficult video for me to make so far. I started this script back in February, and it went through so many edits and revisions, so I'm glad to get it out finally. Anyways, I've given my answer, I've done enough talking, so I leave you guys with a question. Who do you hope Mr. Grizz is? Well, until next time, see ya!